Welcome to EB-5 Investment Voice, where attorney insights intersects with immigration investments. If you are a foreign investor, domestic fund manager, or enterprising entrepreneur and want to get the most out of the EB-5 program, you have come to the right place. I'm Mark Deal, and I'll be your co-host on this journey. I'm joined by your host, Mona Shaw, and other attorneys at Mona Shaw & Associates, as well as immigration leaders from around the world. So let's get into EB-5 Investment Voice. Hey, Mona. Hi, Mark. I just got back from China last night. Well, we're certainly glad to have you back from China, Mona. You know, one of the concerns I hear about the EB-5 is the riskiness. Investors are understandably reluctant to invest in projects that won't succeed or even start without a complete round of funding, which is why I think today's discussion will be a welcome one. We're going to be exploring a regional center where EB-5 Capital actually replaces already existing equity or bank loans. Not only are these projects already funded, but most of them are already under construction. That's right, Mark. This is an issue which I think that um, it's good for our listeners to understand the different ways that financing, EB-5 financing is used and whether one way is less risky than others. Of course, every way has a risk, but it's obviously there are different perceptions, which is why we're honored today to have Roger Christoph from Keystone Developers to join us today. Hi, Roger. Good morning, Mona. Good morning, Mark. Good morning, Roger. Roger, I think you'll be the perfect guest to help us explore this. For those of you that don't know, Roger Christoph is the founder and CEO of Keystone EB5 and Great Texas Regional Center, gaining an early start as a registered broker-dealer with the Financial Institution Regulatory Authority, as well as the Securities Exchange Commission. He brings over 30 years of financial securities experience that includes investment management of public and private equities to EB5 projects and investors. It's this background that enables Roger to bring a welcomed approach that includes replacing existing equity or bank loans with EB-5 funding. Again, welcome to the show, Roger. Thanks. Good to be here. Roger, I'm going to start by asking, what is the name of the company? I do have people who are confused between, are you the Great Texas Regional Center? Are you a Keystone Regional Center? And where are you based? My parent company is really called Keystone Solutions, and we really have four business units. One is wealth management, one is investment banking, another one is consulting both in real estate development and healthcare, and then our fourth business unit is investment immigration or EB-5. And in that business unit, we have three regional centers. The first one that we founded back in 2012 is called Great Texas Regional Center that covers the entire state of Texas. Our other two regional centers are in Keystone, New England and Keystone Midwest. So we're just trying to use the Keystone brand in the future. Got it. So you're not just based in Texas. No, we're not in Texas. In fact, uh, Keystone Solutions headquarters is in Chicago. But you have a very famous partner who is based in Texas. Isn't that correct? That's correct. And so when I when I first heard about the EB-5 business, the geographic area I wanted was the state of Texas because of the economic growth, a lot of major corporations moving to Texas. And I knew Texas well because I went to university there. Um, in addition, my co-founder is Neil Bush, happens to be the brother of President George W. Bush, the brother of Governor of Florida Jeb Bush, and the son of President George H.W. Bush. And the Bush family, their primary goal was to create jobs in their home state of Texas and leverage off of the relationship with China. That's very impressive, Roger. I do know from working with other regional centers where there are um, high-profile members that you are under more pressure when there is a high-profile member. First of all, your project has to be very squeaky clean, um, and as well as your methods. Absolutely. I mean, we have to protect that Bush brand. And so it was very important for us to make sure that our foreign investors not only got their green card, but also got all of their investment capital back. And Mona, that's what led me to working with um, Ray Hunt. 
Um, Ray Hunt is in the Forbes 400. I don't know. He's number 80, 90, 100, a multi, multi billionaire, big Bush supporter. In fact, donated $35 million to the uh, George W. Bush Library right there in Dallas. And we basically wanted to co-invest with Mr. Hunt on his real estate projects because he has a very strong track record on his real estate investment performance. Um, he has a excellent reputation in the community, Dallas community, for being a very ethical businessman. And so when Neil Bush and I founded Great Texas Regional Center, it was important for us to make sure our investors were investing with developers that had experience and had a long track record of success and that had the reputation of treating their co-investors well and fairly. Let me ask you this, Roger. Obviously, you're working with a lot of domestic high net worth investors, but you know, why do these billionaires need EB-5 capital? And is there any benefit to the EB-5 investors to work with a, an EB-5 regional center that is already working with these domestic high net worth investors? So that's a great question, Mark. These billionaires don't need EB-5 capital. In fact, right. when I sat down with the Hunt Group, the first response was, Roger, I love the Bush family, but we don't need your capital. I've got financial institutions, Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan, Metropolitan Insurance Company asking to invest in my projects. The reason, Mark, that Hunt took our capital was I gave them a significant lower interest rate than what they would get out in the marketplace. And that lower interest rate um, helps generate a higher investment return on their equity investment. And to be fair, Mark and Roger, that a lot of the real estate which we're seeing, especially in New York and places like Texas, uh, this is the reason that people are uh, using EB-5 because it's a lot less money. Um, mezzanine loans, for example, are a lot less money using EB-5. If an ordinary project was going out to get a MES loan, it's about 11 to 13 percent. Isn't that correct? That's absolutely correct. Yeah. So this is the good news about the EB-5 industry is you have these higher quality real estate developers that never heard of EB-5 five years ago are now using EB-5, which greatly reduces the amount of fraud or scandal that was part of the industry, you know, seven, eight, ten years ago. Ah, uh, I see. That actually answers the second part of my question is, you know, what's the benefit to EB-5 investors? But you just answered it. They now have access to these higher quality developers that have been, uh, you know, working with these domestic high net worth investors. Well, now, you know, foreign investors have access to these same developers that already have a proven track record eh, long before EB-5. Well, Mark, also, I think that one should really look at the overall credibility of EB-5. I have a thorny question coming for you in a second, Roger, but I will start by saying that the popularity of EB-5 today is what it is because of these big investors coming in and putting their name to EB-5 and basically saying, yes, this is a great program. It's going to be able to create jobs and I'll put my name to it and give you one of my projects uh, to add to the credibility. Y you mean it's not the show? <laughs> <laughs> Roger, what would you say to say somebody who, who's listening, say maybe from one of the congressional offices, and they are thinking in their mind, but wait a minute, isn't EB-5 out there supposed to help people? And aren't you using projects and money, which is in the TEA area? And are you really doing something for the community and for, for the US if you're just giving developers more money back? Well, here's how I would answer that question. The program was established to create jobs in America. And whether you're a Forbes 400 billionaire real estate developer or you're a brand new real estate developer, both of those projects are creating jobs. The reason that if I'm a congressman or senator, the reason I would prefer some developer with lots of experience is because the likelihood of that project being completed, the likelihood of that project being a success is far greater than some amateur developer that 
cannot get money from the bank, cannot get money from a private equity firm, has to go over to China and pay some agent an exorbitant fee to get the money. Just because a, a bad project has money doesn't mean it's a good project. Now, it's still a bad project. Roger, that really takes me into my, you know, really segues nicely into my next question. You actually are one of the regional centers who refuses to pay high fees to agents. Right now, some of the agents in China are really asking exorbitant fees, and people are giving it to them. But uh, from my understanding and knowledge and working with all types of different regional centers and projects, is that if an agent is asking that exorbitant type of money, um, there's going to be overall less capital and less likelihood that an investor will be repaid anywhere near on time, if at all. Yes, we don't use agents. And we don't use agents for two reasons. One, we don't believe they're transparent at all with their clients, not only in terms of disclosing how much money they're making from regional centers or developers, but we don't think that they're fully transparent on the documentation from a translation standpoint. We also don't like the agents because we think they're just charging usurious amount of money. In the United States, a broker dealer, an investment manager has limits on how much they can charge a commission or a fee. And those limits are single digit percentages. The agents over around the world, not just China, but Vietnam and other places are charging double digit fees and commissions And it's just not right. Well, let me ask you this, Roger, because you have worked as a registered broker dealer for over 30 years and you were just in China a month ago. And I realize you're going to be in China uh, about a week from now. Uh, How does that make you feel to know that you've been doing this for like 30 years with the regulations that are placed here in the United States for broker dealers to see that agents are you know, perhaps not being transparent enough and and charging really high fees? I think you kind of. You mentioned it a little bit, but I want to know you specifically, Roger, how does that make you feel? Well, I don't think it's right. <laughs> I think that it's greedy. And when greed gets into business, mistakes are made. There is plenty of money in this EB-5 sector for everyone to make a great amount of money without overcharging. And so we just don't work with that people out of principle. It's not necessary And unfortunately, the problem here, Mark, is in many cases, the worst projects get funded because the worst projects are willing to pay the highest commission because they need the money. That's totally correct. Yes, Uh, that's that's totally right, Roger. I mean, it's It's quite bad to see. I mean, if anybody is listening out there and they're asking, well, how do these e-fees and and stuff work? A lot of the times the fees are paid by projects from the back end, meaning that a percentage is paid per person um, as as well as the full administration fee. So if a project is giving that much money, and sometimes we're talking about 40 to 30 to 40 percent of the 500,000 is going to some projects, some agents rather, there really, uh, there has to be a shortfall somewhere. The the maths just don't work. But Roger, if you're not paying agents and are not using agents, where are you getting your investors from? Good question. So we have a network of lawyers, consultants, accountants, existing investors. I mean, we're not doing huge projects. We're not doing 1,000 investor, 500 investor projects. You know, our average size project is maybe 50 investors. And we have a network of people that are centers of influence in their communities, in their cities, and they're referring people to us. In addition, we will go over and do a seminar, advertise a little bit, and find our clients that way. Interesting. Well, the the thing is with using uh, getting a network, though, it's not so easy for somebody just to jump in and go and do that. For someone who's listening, who's starting their own regional center or starting a project, the known way is let's go to China, let's go to Vietnam and, and contact an agent. Do you have any words of advice for somebody who is just thinking about that route? Well, it might not be complimentary to the industry, <laughs> but, but here's, the, here's the, the lawyers, the economists, the consultants that advise someone 
on getting a regional center, don't tell them what yes. happens after they get the license and how difficult it is to get the money and how exorbitant the fees are. So, Mona, you know this. Five years ago, to hire a Chinese agent to get investors for you, it was twenty thousand dollars per investor. Flat. No, I say eight years ago, not five. Five years oh. ago, <laughs> right. about, about eight, eight to ten years ago, it was twenty twenty-five thousand. And each year, it's gone up. And then they started asking for part of the interest rate in addition to that. So today, I mean, heck, you. You may know more than me because I'm not talking to agents, but from what I hear, the the agents are getting sixty, seventy thousand dollars per client plus an additional one, two, or three percent of the interest rate. And yet, the Chinese national who is applying has no idea that that agent is making that kind of money because I hear that the Chinese national is. Paying the agent an additional fee. Not just in China, Roger. It's happening.、Uh, from what I'm hearing, it's happening all over the world. Where it, where there's an agency, there is there's unfortunately there is this、um, adherence to the high fees. What it can amount to is 150 to 170 thousand per investor. So that is high enough money for a person to be able to go out and、uh, say what they want to a candidate to be able to get that person into the project, regardless of whether that project is good or bad. I personally feel that the only way that this is going to be curtailed is if it becomes mandatory. Um, and Congress can do this、um, if it becomes mandatory to name the agent or to name the amount of money which is given out. Well, in the U.S., in the U.S. securities, that all has to be disclosed in the memorandum, because.、Mm-hmm. But it's not. You know that, and I know that it's not. <laughs> You're right, and I'll tell you a funny story. I was Neil Bush and I were in China. I don't know four years ago, sitting at one of the largest agents. Conference room, and Mr. Bush asked the CEO of the agent, "You know, in the U.S., we have all this risk factors, disclosures that we have to do. How do your how do your clients respond when they have to go through the memorandum and read all about these risk factors?" And the agent CEO looked right at Mr. Bush and said, "We do some creative translation." In other words, <laughs> wow! Words, you might not see that in our Chinese version of our PPM. You mean it's an alternative facts? <laughs>、yeah. Look, I'm not saying all the agents、uh. out there are bad because we know that's not true. We know there's good agents. We know they're providing good service. I just haven't found one yet, and I'd sure welcome the call for someone because I operate the old school way. Okay, I am trained on Wall Street. Um, institutionally trained, where everything is ready, aim, fire, and what's I'm more concerned about not the wrapping of the box, but what's inside the box that matters. And a lot of these agents, a lot of these regional centers, spend a tremendous amount of money on marketing and the wrapping around the box,、um, and they're not that concerned about what's inside the box. But Roger, if you're saying that your projects are more secure and they're a better investment, are you taking anything away from the risk element, which is so important for EB five? No, because our our projects definitely qualify as risk. Where we mitigate the risk is who our developer is, and that's what every EB five investor should be focused on. They should be focused on who is the developer. What is their track record? What is their experience? That's the most important piece for an EB five investor. True,、um, not, true, not Roger. The but brand of the hotel, not the location of where the where the the the, the, the project is. It's who's the guy responsible. For this project, and what's his background been? But Roger, I would I would argue with that one because I I don't. When I'm talking to investors, I actually say yes. You know, you look at the developer, but also look at the location, look at the actual project. You're not looking necessarily at past、uh, projects. You're looking at this project because that's where you're putting your money into. Even somebody like、uh, President Trump has had failed projects, and he's had a lot of、uh, successful projects too. Yes, he has. But President Trump, from a real estate development standpoint, I would say his reputation is controversial. There's some good. There's some bad. 
the people I work with, there's only good. Those three billionaires that I work with are Ray Hunt, Neil Bloom, and Sir Richard Branson. So let's talk a little bit about that, Roger. Of course, being English, I, I know very well all about uh, Richard Branson, but perhaps you might want to explain a little about the three. Okay, well, I'll just real quickly, I'll go through the three people. We'll end on Richard Branson because that's our current project. So Ray Hunt inherited quite a sum of money from his from his father, who at one point was the wealthiest American, H.L. Hunt, who made his fortune in the oil industry in the United States. So Ray inherited about $200 million, and he self-made, created that 200 into well over $5 billion, not only in energy, but also in real estate. So if you've been to Dallas, the iconic building in Dallas is called Reunion Tower. That's a Ray Hunt development. In addition to that, he's done lots of apartment buildings, hotels, uh, senior living facilities, and he has a sterling perfect record in the real estate development that he and his team have done. The second person we work with is Neil Bloom. Neil is self-made three to five billionaire listed in the Forbes 400, I don't know, 110, 120, um, founded a company called JMB Realty, which was the largest shopping center, high-end shopping center developer in the country. If you've been to Los Angeles, there's an area there called Century City. Uh, Neil Bloom developed that. If you've been to Chicago, Water Tower Place, Bloomingdale's, Neil also owns six casinos, regional casinos around the United States, six Four Season hotels, two Ritz Carlton's, developments all over the world, 50 billion all over the world. Finally, Sir Richard Branson. Richard Branson has a reputation of identifying shortcomings in the service industry. And so he's identified a few shortcomings in the in the hospitality hotel industry in the United States. And he is going to now his plan is to build 25 virgin hotels around the United States, beginning with Dallas. Great. So really, to sum up, Roger, your idea of um, less risk is to go with a project where there is a developer of par excellence, right? Yes, Mona, because they've had the experience. They've Sure, they made mistakes, but they made those mistakes 20, 30 years ago. Uh, they have a team of employees and partners that have been doing this for years. And so kind of what gave EB-5 a bad reputation just to go back in history a little bit, yeah. is you had developers that, you know, built a duplex and it was successful. And now they put a hat on their head and said, I'm a developer. And they went to the bank with their business plan. The, and the, the, the bank officer who knows hotels or apartments read the business plan and said, this is not good. Your assumptions are all wrong. I'm not loaning you any money. And so where did this amateur developer go to get money to build his project and earn his development fee. Well, somebody told him about EB-5, and he went over to China. He paid an agent, whatever he needed to, to get that project funded. Right, and unfortunately, but those projects didn't turn out so well. But notwithstanding that, Roger, EB-5 has given people, um, it has given developers an opportunity where they may not have found it. Correct. <laughs> and I agree. You're right on that. But I would, I would say those projects are riskier than co-investing with the developers that I work with. Thank you for exploring that with us, Roger. I certainly agree with your earlier statement that when greed gets into business, uh, mistakes are made. Roger Christoph, thank you so much for coming on EB5 Investment Voice. Oh, thank you, Mark. And thank you, Mona. Thank you. Thank you for being with us today on EB5 Investment Voice. The topics presented in this podcast is informational in nature and is not to be taken as specific legal advice. If you have questions on the topics presented in this episode or other investment immigration needs, please contact Mona Shaw and Associates. Mona and her attorney staff can be reached at mshawlaw.com. That's M-S-H-A-H law.com. Make sure you don't miss our next episode focusing on a different aspect of the EB-5 program by subscribing to the podcast. While you're at it, leave us a rating on iTunes. If you really found this episode valuable, share it with someone else that could benefit from this information. 
Until then, I'll see you on the next episode of EB5 Investment Voice. 